all heard some version of the story about the blind men and the elephant, right? Each one of them touches a different part of the elephant and returns a different description of what an elephant is like. An elephant is like a tree trunk. An elephant is like a rope. An elephant is like a fan. An elephant is like a wall. An elephant is like one of those old parallel backplane cables we use to connect network switching boxes. Um, okay, maybe I added the last one. FPGAs are like that too. Depending on when and how you use them last and for what purpose, you might have a completely different story about what an FPGA is. An FPGA is glue logic. An FPGA is a sophisticated system on chip. An FPGA is tiny, less than 5 millimeters on a side. An FPGA is huge, the biggest chip I've ever put on my board. FPGAs cost less than a dollar. FPGAs cost thousands of dollars. An FPGA is like a rope. Oh wait, um, yeah, that was the elephant story again, sorry. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Through the years, FPGAs have changed so much that we really shouldn't even be using the same name for them anymore. FPGAs have changed in size, price, function, capability, and even architecture. Today I'm going to chat with Umar Mungal from Altera about the evolution of FPGAs, what today's FPGAs can do, and where this exciting technology is headed in the future. Welcome Umar, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Amelia. So today we will be talking about convergence and the evolution of FPGAs. Take us back a little and tell us where we started and where we are coming from with FPGA technology. About three decades ago, when FPGAs came into existence, they were created for the sole purpose of system debug. Okay. And this is for hardware debug. Mm -hmm. With multiple components on the system, you needed something in the middle where you could pass through signals and monitor them and see if there's anything wrong and be able to fix that. Mm -hmm. So FPGAs have become a lot more than just LUTs, right? Absolutely. In fact, if you look at what's happened to FPGAs over time, just the sheer number of transistors has gone exponentially up in the last couple of generations. Mm -hmm. We've grown from absolutely small number of LUTs to millions of LUTs now into a single FPGA. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the number of LUTs anymore. We're talking about IOs that have been hardened. Mm -hmm. We're talking about transceivers, DSP blocks, and a lot of features within DSP blocks as well, which have been integrated over time. FPGAs are not FPGAs anymore. It's not the same. So, Umar, what does this mean for the role of FPGAs in the system? With this evolution of FPGAs, about a decade ago, everything changed. Instead of being for system debug and doing some level shifting, mm -hmm. they were used as accelerators for co-processing in the system. So you would hook it up right next to the CPU or the DSP or an ASIC some of our customers had, mm. which enabled them to get higher efficiency. Okay, so that gets us up to about 10 years ago. What do FPGAs look like now? I'm glad you asked. They're in the heart of the system now. If you look at a lot of our customers' designs, the FPGA is the biggest contributor to the bill of materials. True. The reason for that is a lot of the integration that's gone on over time. You look at transceivers, 10 gig transceivers, 28 gig transceivers, mm -hmm. it's on the FPGA. The CPU being our Neo soft processor, that's on the FPGA. You have a lot of on-chip memory. You've got interfaces for DRAM. All of that is now on the FPGA itself, and everything around is more about supporting it, being off-chip memory, regulators that are required, mm -hmm. the, the stuff that we can't really integrate into the FPGA today. So if FPGAs are going to be the heart of the system, what happens to the other components? Well, this is where we get into the silicon convergence. Okay. If you look at historically, what was a cell phone? It was just voice. Mm -hmm and you used some other component for your data, you used another component to connect to the internet, right. and all of that converged and it formed into a smart phone. Mm -hmm. We're seeing something similar happen in the FPGA space. ASICs and ASSPs do not make sense anymore. It's the economics. Mm -hmm. A lot of our customers are telling us with 28 nanometers and beyond, 
the volumes aren't there for them to actually develop their own ASIC. In fact, it's gotten to the point where a lot of ASSP companies are actually questioning that as well. Hmm. They do have a lot of value. It's function specific. Mm -hmm. You get the performance that you need. It's ideal. The cost is perfect as well. Mm. But the economics just don't make sense. And on the other side, you have microprocessor companies, you have DSP companies as well, where they provide all the programmability and the flexibility, but they are not ideal to be used in a lot of these systems. Ah, okay. So what we're seeing over time is a convergence of all of these into one. A lot of these different functions require some level of hardware programmability as well, which is not easy to get. Mm -mm. There are a handful of companies which actually have that expertise. It's not just about the silicon. It's about the software. It's mm -hmm. the ecosystem that comes into play as well. And from that perspective, FPGA companies are ideally suited for this convergence to occur. FPGAs in the future will become the gravitational point as to where all of these components will come into play. I see. So FPGAs are about to start even the processing subsystem now, right? Absolutely. You look at the emerging FPGAs today, we're mm -hmm. talking about SOC. When we look at SOC, it's a combination of the FPGAs and the processor subsystem. Mm -hmm. In our case, we're using dual ARM A9s. Okay. Would that change in the future to something else? More than likely. Mm -hmm. And it's going after multiple different applications in the space today. But higher performance applications might require a different kind of processor, might mm -hmm. require different peripherals. True. And beyond what we have today, it looks like we might have to do multiple different flavors of SOCs as well. Okay, so FPGAs and SOCs are merging now. Where do you see FPGAs headed in the next couple decades? Well, if you look at Moore's Law, so far, to date, it has enabled all of these different silicon companies to introduce double the density about mm -hmm. every 18 months. Yeah. With 28 nanometers and beyond, what's happening is the Moore's Law might not come into play enough. Hmm. And as you see, a lot of the processor companies, they've introduced dual core, mm -hmm. quad core, A cores and beyond. That's what they're talking about. Does it make sense for FPGA companies to actually do dual core FPGAs in the system? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. But we believe because of the convergence, it might be a lot more than that. Hmm. We're looking at ASIC technology being integrated. Altera has hard copy ASICs. Mm -hmm. We have that expertise and experience and available to us. There is ASSP technology as well. I use PCI Express Gen 2 by 8 as an example. Yeah. We've hardened it today. There's no reason why we can't do other vertical specific IP that we can harden into FPGAs as well. And as we talked previously, multiple different flavors of microprocessors. You take that, you take the DSP, which we already have, and mm -hmm. we're we'll continuing to evolve that, and the FPGA. That's where I basically see the next few decades. This is where the FPGA will become software programmable in the next couple of decades. So nobody wants to write enough HDL to fill up one of these things. Help me out here, Umar. This looks like a nightmare. How are people going to design these things? Absolutely. And this is another thing that we recognize. RTL design, well, not everyone wants to be involved with that. Yes. Our experience is that a lot of our customers have 10 times the C programmers than they have RTL engineers. True. So we wanted to see a lot of these C programmers are targeting CPUs today or DSPs today. In the future, if FPGAs do become the core silicon, mm -hmm. then we need to go and target these engineers. Mm. In that case, we're looking at high level languages in the future. So some of the GPU companies have CUDA as an example. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at is OpenCL, a standard which enables C programmers to target FPGAs without them having to really learn about FPGAs and how they're programmable. There's a huge investment going on right now in that space, and it's going to become an emerging language for us in the future. Great. People throw this term platform around a lot. What does that really mean, and how does it apply here? I call it the social network phenomenon. If you look at the 
social network platforms available today, uh -huh. what they've done is revolutionized the way we actually behave. We True. communicate through that. Mm -hmm. We play games on that. We actually do purchases on that as well. True. And that's just the beginning. Future currency, what you do with deals, and what happens in the mobile space and tablet space, it's all being defined by these social network platforms. Mm. We believe that FPGAs have a parallel to that, where FPGAs will become the platform of choice, mm -hmm. where you'll be able to create all these different applications. In our case, we're talking about motor control, mm, right. high performance computing, remote mm -hmm. radio heads as examples, without having to go and target multiple different pieces of silicon. Right. So that's the parallel of the social network platform to the FPGA platform. And from my perspective, this is a huge paradigm shift mm -hmm. in how FPGAs will be used in systems in the future. Hmm. Interesting. So clearly this isn't a science fair project. Umar, this seems like a lot of work. Why would a company like Altera want to get into this? Well, Altera is trying to change the market. Okay. We're using FPGAs and this concept of silicon convergence to break these barriers. Ah, okay. The PLD industry last year was about $5 billion. We see a huge market opportunity where we can go and replace ASICs, ASSPs, and embedded mm -hmm. in the future. And for that, we're making all the investments today. Mm -hmm. We're integrating silicon. We're introducing high-level language. We're also looking at different ways and different methodologies, how we can make it a lot more efficient for our designers to just use our FPGAs. From my perspective, it's not a $5 billion market anymore. Mm -hmm. It's $63 billion for us today. <laughs> Very nice. Well, I think that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for joining me today, Umar. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much. And before we go, don't forget to click that download now button below the player to download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the on-demand section of eejournal.com. <laughs>